thing that we could hear on that flight was the wailing of people. Because some of the fortunate family members managed to get onto that flight. Nevertheless, when we landed, people were sobbing. They were sobbing because every person on that flight had lost a loved one. When we went out to do an initial assessment of what we had seen in the city, Allahu Akbar, buildings 20 stories, 30 stories, some as 50 stories had collapsed, had crumbled. Shopping centers had crumbled. And it, remember, this happened at a time when the people were in the deepest of their sleep. It was very, very cold. It was snowing. And this earthquake took place. 7.6 on the Richter scale. But what makes this earthquake even a bit more challenging? And even scientists once again are baffled by this. That in the span of just nine hours, you got two earthquakes in the very same area, in the very same zone. One was sitting at 7.7 .7 and one was at 7.6. Never ever has this been recorded. Uh, we will focus a bit more on the spiritual aspect of this a little later, but in order for us to understand how serious the situation was. Many of buildings that managed to withstand the initial earthquake, in the second earthquake, they had collapsed. In fact, in the second earthquake, many search and rescue personnel were also engulfed and trapped in that very second earthquake when buildings had collapsed. So one can understand how serious the situation is. In the city of Hatay, and Hatay has a lot of Islamic connotation to it, a lot of Islamic history to it, the main, the main street of the, of the CBD, the Central Business District, it runs for approximately maybe about five kilometers. Every single building on either side had collapsed. There was an area which was demarcated for, uh, for, for the landing of helicopters and where search and rescue teams from all over the world, the world were stationed. This was just an empty piece of ground. It was more like a soccer field. And we had from over 70 countries, certain rescue personnel were allocated in spots. And this has become their base. And from there, they would go out to different areas. So helicopters would land every few minutes. One certain rescue team would come off, and the next one would jump on, and they would be taken to some area. So in the initial, initial days, uh, there was a lot of chance of finding survivors. Now, I just wanted to imagine, imagine people stuck under that rubble. Imagine if one of us had to be stuck under the rubble. We can't take any pressure on our body for a little span of time. People were stuck under rubble for up to 286 hours. I went out to an area, we were told in a certain area, you know what? Somebody is still living. This was after maybe 200 some of hours. And I really wanted to see and experience what it is to take somebody alive from the rubble. And when we came there, there was a hive of activity. And certain rescue teams were there, and they, they brought in all the bulldozers, they brought in all these graders, all these cranes, and they were trying to remove the, 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 the rubble. And subhanAllah, all of a sudden, they asked for everything to be quiet. Generators were switched off, the bulldozers switched off, and then they said, everyone even switch off your cell phones. And then they're screaming out there, and you can hear a faint voice that comes out from the rubble. There was a 17-year-old girl, and subhanAllah, they had taken her out of the rubble alive. After how many hours? After over 200 some odd hours, she and her mother. How people survived? Only Allah wa alam. Because what science tells us is that the human body cannot take that for such a long period of time. How people have survived is only from Allah ta'ala azawajal. Another thing which caught my eye, a bit of the brothers, I was really intrigued what they are, so when, when you're standing there out at this pile of rubble, there are family members that are standing and waiting in anticipation and anxiety, waiting for their loved ones to be retrieved. So the chances of rescue and survival has become very, very bleak. So now you're just waiting for the retrieval of a body. i would seen this on a few occasions. One area I went to, subhanAllah, there was a very old lady and she was sitting on the floor. And in that few minutes, they had found and retrieved a body and they brought the body out in a, in a, in a blanket. This old lady, she had went to identify the body. And SubhanAllah, you know, it, it really grips the soul. And trust me, brothers, what the Ummah needs today, more than the food and the water and the shelter, even in our own communities, what people really need is that human interaction from one to one. People have a lot of stress. People have a lot of depression, etc. What they really need is that humanitarian ear and heart. 
And subhanAllah, you know, I tried to console this old woman. I tried to console her because that was one of her family members. And uh, trust me, there was no hearse, there was no ambulance to take the body. They took the body, they put it in the back of a, of a car, and they're taking it away for ghusl and dafan. And that had become the order of the day. I went to another area. I met a, a, another man. He was tearing in his eye. He could speak a bit of Arabic. Ask him, what, what, what's happening? He says to me, you see this pile of rubble here? Twelve of my family members are there. I'm standing here for days on end, hoping to retrieve them, so that we can give them a proper burial and a, and a, and a janazah, etc. This had become the order of the day. Wherever you went, another area we went out to, why are we standing there? It was a very tall building, and maybe a few feet up, you know, uh, the, the certain rescuers were, were trying to, 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 to get into the rubble. And next minute, they make an announcement. They say, we found a body of a young girl. The face is gone. But over the last few days, she's put henna on her hands. Has anyone's daughter or child or sister put henna on their hands over the last few days? Please come up and identify the body. Subhanallah. So while you're standing there, bodies have been retrieved. They're left on the side. And they're left for people to identify. When they're not identified, they're then taken to a certain place. In this area I went to, on the roadside, they had set up these gazebos. Some of them were for Tayyabun, and some of them for, for Ghusl. And subhanAllah, you know, as you're standing there, by the minute, bodies are coming. Bodies are coming. And they've been identified, is it for Ghusl or is it for Tayyabun? Then, after the Ghusl is made, and they put into a coffin, there's a note which is put out there, that this body was retrieved at this address. A certain amount of time is given for people to come and identify the body. If not, there's a team on hand that takes the body and they bury it in the cemetery which is opposite the zone. There's so much to speak about that we don't have enough time. But one thing that stood out for me, my beloved brothers, out of this entire tragedy and this disaster, is what I realized is that human suffering from, a, from an emotional perspective, this is something which was on steroids if I may put it to you that way. The human suffering from an emotional perspective, how people had to deal with their loved ones still underneath the rubble. Let me just quickly focus for a minute or two what we saw in Syria. When we crossed over the border into Syria, remember now, Syria is already a war zone. Alhamdulillah, we were given special permission to enter into Syria. We were one of the very first teams to enter into Syria. When I came into Syria, it really, really hurt my heart because there were no certain rescue teams. Families were using shovels and spades and trying to dig out to get to the to, to the to the the front doors of their homes just to try and retrieve or rescue their loved ones. In fact, ourselves also we tried to help and assist, but these are mountains of rubble and mountains of debris. You know, you need some graders, etc. In the entire Syria, I only saw two graders. And where did I see these graders? There was an area that we went to where five buildings, five apartment blocks simply crumbled. When I got here, the brother said to me, Sheikh, be careful how you walk. You made this walk on my body. 900 people perished here. 900 people perished. And subhanAllah, in this very same area, only one thing stood in its glory. And what was that? A masjid. Masjid Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu. Everything around it was gone, except this masjid. Now, across this entire region of 750,000 square kilometers, I can assure you, that yes, masjids were damaged, but I did not see a masjid completely destroyed. Masjids were damaged, but it was still possible for us to make salah in them. I did not see a masjid damaged. Let me go back to 2018 in the city of Palu in Indonesia. There was a tsunami. Everything was gone except this masjid. And this masjid stood in its body in the sea because the water had receded the, 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 the land. So this has become a norm. Allah is giving us a sign. Connect our hearts and our souls to the masjid. Because this is where we will find refuge. Refuge for what? Firstly for our iman. And then for so many other things. From the fitna that is around us today. So youth and my brothers, connect ourselves with the masjid. I've got two minutes left and let me quickly tell you. What are the lessons that we need to take from this? This is the most important thing which we, which we need to focus on. Brothers, we must be very careful when we go to sleep at night. Because we don't know whether we'll get up alive the next morning. People here went to sleep at night and only to find themselves under a pile of rubble or debris the next morning. See, this device I'm holding in my hand is a very dangerous device. And I speak to myself, and this is also my weakness. Before we go to sleep at night, what's the norm? 
we quickly check our messages, our social media, etc. And sometimes things pop up which we should not be seeing. It's the wrong time for us to engage. When we go to sleep at night, it's the night for our kalimas, our du'as, etc. Remember, let's close our eyes. Although it's going to be asleep, close our eyes on a good note. Close our eyes on a good note with some good deed. We never know whether we'll wake up tomorrow. Secondly, I've spoken about emotional support. This is very, very important. Let's offer one another emotional support, especially in today's times. It is very, 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 very trying. Also remember, life can turn around very suddenly and very, very, very quickly. Why do I say this? We went to an area where the building still stood in its glory, but every one of those buildings would have to be demolished. It became a simple ghost town. This was an elite area of Adana, People, one night, the night they went to sleep, they were in the cozy, comfortable beds in modern, lavish, luxurious apartments. And literally the next day, they found themselves in a tent. So therefore, even our lifestyles, be very, very, very careful of our lifestyles. Let's not become accustomed to a very comfortable, luxurious lifestyle. Don't spoil ourselves because we don't know when things can change. Ten years ago, we didn't have the issue of load sharing. Ten years on, now we've got to plan ourselves. My point that I'm trying to make, don't become too accustomed to a very luxurious, comfortable lifestyle. Sometimes it's also important for us, they say simplicity is the best policy. So when we live a life, look at those around us. There's so much of poverty around us, etc. Let us try and live a, a comfortable life, but not extravagance. Be very, very, very careful with that in regard. And I'll end up on this point. You know, when these disasters happen, when these earthquakes, etc. happen, people are very quick to judge. They're very quick to draw, draw conclusions. Oh, these people must have been engrossed in this sin, so they got this azab. They must have been doing this deeds, they got this. They love the brothers. Wallahi, we can never judge. We can never ever judge. Remember, all these people that passed on in this disaster, they will have the category of shuhada and shaheed. And we understood the status and the value of a shaheed. Any one of those 58,000 people that passed on, if they come back into the... Ask them, would you like to come back to the dunya? Never! Because the deal that they got to pass on in this way, to leave the world in this way, is one of the most noble of ways to leave in. And ask them in the Akhirah, what, uh, what an amazing deal that they will have in the Akhirah. So brothers, we will never understand Allah's wisdom. And we will never understand why Allah allows certain things to take place. But yes, there is a quota of shuhada for the year that needs to be filled. So Allah will bring about certain situations for that quota to be filled. And remember, we take lessons. We take lessons. Many noble, good people, very pious people also perished in this earthquake. They passed on. And the, every one of them have got the status of a shaheed. May Allah Azza wa grant every one of them the highest status in general for those for the Qabr al-Nur. May Allah Azza wa Jal allow us to take the correct lessons from this entire disaster. Let it be a wake-up call for every one of us. And what's the wake-up call? Life is very, very short. And life can turn around very quickly. You can go to sleep tonight in a bed, a warm bed, in a, in, a, in a modern home, and the next day you can be in a tent. And that is exactly what we had seen. So many different lessons we can take from this. We pray to Allah Ta'ala Azza wa Jal. He makes it easy. And Alhamdulillah, uh, our humanitarian work will continue. You're more than welcome to engage us after the Jummah to ask about how, what, we, what, what we can do as a community or what we can do as an individual or families to help and assist our brothers and sisters in need. Remember, as long as we are giving, we will always be giving. As long as we are giving, we will always be giving.